Welcome and thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Crexy Podcast, an insider's look at all things commercial real estate. In this show, we cover a broad range of topics that both cater to commercial real estate newcomers and industry leaders alike. I'm your host, Giannis Papadakis, Business Development Manager at Crexy, and today we are thrilled to sit down with Doug Farron, co-founder and managing partner at Shoreham Capital. Before we dive in, a little bit about our guest. Doug Farron is a real estate leader and skilled deal maker, specializing in sourcing, capitalizing, structuring, and executing debt and equity transactions throughout the United States. With nearly two decades of experience, Doug has overseen over $10 billion of real estate investments and developments across asset classes and the capital stack. Throughout his career, Doug has successfully executed the investment, development, and management of residential, retail, hotel, office, and mixed-use assets in major markets, including New York City, Los Angeles, Miami, and Washington, D.C. As co-founder and managing partner of Shoreham Capital, Doug oversees all aspects of the firm, including the acquisition, capitalization, development, and management of their projects. With his extensive quantitative and strategic analysis background across various transaction types, Doug helps Shoreham target high-quality real estate investments that deliver superior risk-adjusted returns for investors. Before Shoreham, Doug spent 10 years at the CIM Group a $35 billion AUM real estate private equity firm, working as managing director and overseeing the firm's East Coast investment platform. Prior to CIM, Doug worked in corporate private equity for LNK Partners and in investment banking in the mergers and acquisitions group at Deschutes Bank in New York City. Doug is an active member of ULI, NMHC, NAIOP, and ICSC, in case we're missing any acronyms, and is a longtime supporter of the Harlem Lacrosse Program in New York City and Los Angeles. Doug graduated from Brown University with a dual concentration in international relations and economics and received his MBA from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. He resides in Palm Beach, Florida with his wife, Barbara, and two children, Madeline and Jack. Doug, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me and for that generous introduction. Well, you've uh, accomplished a lot. Um, Let's, you know, go into a little bit of that background of yours. We got a little bit through your bio, but tell me a little bit about yourself and how you came to uh, the commercial real estate market and the industry as a whole. Sure. So, um, you know, I, as you mentioned, started my career in investment banking. I worked at Deutsche Bank in their M&A team in New York and then went on to work in corporate private equity. Um, and while I really enjoyed sort of the work on the buy side, sort of investing in businesses and operations, I was doing some sort of friend, uh, some nights and weekends investing in real estate. I bought a small multifamily asset out of bankruptcy. I was working on a hotel deal and I was going to business school and knew I wanted to sort of see if the transition to real estate, you know, so I was spending my Nights and weekends on is what I want to do full time. So while I was at Kellogg, I had the opportunity to come to CIM as a summer intern, um, had a great experience, really saw that connectivity between, you know, the interest and aptitude in a space I was really passionate about. And so um, made the transition and spent 10 years at CIM, which, you know, was was very rewarding, I learned a ton. But, you know, the other reason beyond being excited about real estate as an asset class, I wanted to shift from corporate to real estate investing was I felt there was a good opportunity to do something entrepreneurial. And after about 10 years at the firm, um, I felt that it was the right time to try and do something you know, more on my own and you know, was able to find partners to, to build the Shoreham business with. And that sort of brings us to where we are today. So what drew you particularly to the world of investment and development? Sure. So, um, you know, within the real estate world, um, I think that, you know, that the Real estate's a broad asset class, you know, and you know, I've worked on everything from hotels, office, retail, data centers, industrial, infrastructure. And, you know, you can play within the asset class in a lot of different ways. You can, you know, purchase finished assets and core assets and just hold on to them for sort of just, you know, uh, core returns. You can, you know, buy existing assets, reposition them and sell them in that sort of value add spectrum. And you can, you know, take on development risk, which, you know, is certainly the highest risk part of real estate, but also is the highest return. So to me, having a mix of all three of those um, avenues puts together sort of a portfolio for a real estate investment firm that you know, delivers to its investors the best possible outcomes. 
And did you have some mentors that kind of guided your path along the way? If so, how did they help shape that career path of yours? For sure. I mean, I've, I've had great mentors. I've been fortunate to have great mentors throughout my career. I, I had you know, great mentors beginning my career at Deutsche Bank when I was, you know, really learning the ropes of business valuation at, at, uh, at Deutsche Bank and, you know, both folks in the M&A group and folks in the real estate group that, that you know, taught me not only the basics, but some of the sort of like the longer live lessons that are important. Um, you know, throughout business school, I was fortunate to be able to reach out to a lot of alumni, both of my undergraduate program and also of uh, my MBA program. And, you know, people were surprisingly kind and open to getting on the phone, having conversations that really helped guide, you know, not only the transition to real estate, but, you know, where within that spectrum I went. And then at CIM, you know, over time, you know, both the founders and owners of the firm, as well as other folks that I worked with or worked for uh, during my 10 years there were instrumental in sort of shaping, you know, how I thought about business, how I thought about real estate, how I managed the team. Um, and I think it's important to, you know, not go sort of through this business, real estate, especially with your head down. I think it's really important to look for those that you can like learn and grow and, and take great lessons from and, and have that sort of wrap into sort of the career skill set that you develop. Speaking of great lessons, were there any favorite mistakes, let's call them, or moments that course corrected you uh, onto your current path that maybe at the time you didn't realize were opportunities? You know, it's interesting. I mean, I think, you know, within this business, you, you sort of have to look at, uh, especially in the real estate investment space, like what are the deals that went well? What are the deals that went less well? What could you have foreseen? What couldn't you have foreseen? And I spent a lot of time at CIM and, you know, our, our charge there was to invest across asset cl classes, across the capital stack and across geographies. And so I'd say from the beginning of my time there in, you know, 2012, really through, you know, 2021, 2022, um, I went from sort of learning about all these different asset classes and all these different markets to really culling into what I thought the best risk adjusted return, you know, assets were. And, and then thinking about each of these asset classes and each of these geographies accordingly. So, you know, I started there, I was working on deals in Los Angeles, in Texas, in Chicago, in Washington, D.C., in New York, and in Florida. And coming into the, 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 the business, I was sort of treating them all almost equally, like just sort of evaluating each deal on its own merits and thinking about growth and thinking about markets. But, and, and, you know, by the way, within each of those markets, there might be a hotel deal in Los Angeles, there might be a retail deal in Chicago, there might be an office deal in New York, there might be a multifamily deal in D.C., and, you know, as I spent 10 years there, I think you, you really develop the skill set and learn like, OK, investing in a multifamily asset is a very specific set of like risk return outcomes. And what are the key factors you have to zone in on? What is the cost of capital? What's the demand for rent growth? What's your tenant base look like? But that's very different than sort of the risk questions you might ask for an office asset in Chicago or New York. And even those two markets are very different dynamics. So I think along the way. Being able to see, and at CIM, we were cradle to the brave, so we not only invested in assets, but oversaw the execution of the business plan. You got to see you know, what went wrong and what went well, and what were the assets that were really difficult to lease, and what were the assets that leased up above business plan, and really start to hone in your strategy. And I've tried to take all of those lessons from different geographies and different asset classes and really hone that into what has become the shore business. Well... Moving on to our next topic, um, what is Shoreham? Can you uh, provide some context into your team's investment ethos and mission? Sure. So you know, Shoreham Capital is um, a partnership that came out of, um, you know, one, me spending you know, time at CIM and looking to do something more entrepreneurial. And I mentioned that to a friend of mine who um, was uh, a developer in New York, a gentleman named Steve Figari, um, who was, you know, built a development business called Slate Property Group in New York. And we'd sort of always talked about doing something entrepreneurial and he'd want to do something more on his own. And um, I mentioned to him, I had similar aspirations, but and I love the residential space. But at the time, you know, cap rates sort of 2020, late 2020, early 2021 were two and a half to three and a half percent, which to me didn't seem compelling against a long term cost of capital. And so I'd spent a lot of time looking at new business lines with the team at CIM. We'd done some underwriting of uh, single family rental and build to rent. And I felt that the asset class had tremendous growth between sort of demographics, economics, desire for home ownership, what was happening with the millennial and um, baby boom generation. There was a lot of reasons to believe that this asset class was going to grow. And looking for partners in that space, it was really difficult to find a group that could put together the critical elements of executing on that business plan. I mentioned that to Steve and he said, well, you know, my best friend growing up is a large home builder in New York. And so he introduced me to Nick, 
And so, uh, you know, we all sat down. Um, Nick, who you know, built a two hundred million dollar home building business really from scratch, you know, got the opportunity, wanted the transition to being more of an investor and also diversifying his home building business to being for rent. And so, it seemed like a natural fit to be able to put together sort of the ability to. You know, sort of capitalize these deals, interface with large institutions, raise the money to build a large portfolio in the space, execute on the construction with Nick's expertise, which work differently than sort of traditional multifamily, and partner that with the operations and development expertise. So, um, you know, that sort of became the impetus for Shoreham Capital. Um, I went out to a couple of family offices I knew when we raised you know, GP fund that we sort of targeted what we called residential development. So that's both traditional multifamily and value add but also alternatives, which might be senior housing, student housing, adaptive reuse, and really this large vertical as our sort of first foray into the built to rent space. And um, so that's, you know, call that late 21, early 22, we sort of conceive of the business. You know, fast forward to today, we're building about 650 units um, across the Southeast. Um, about half of that's multi, half of that's built to rent. We have another thousand units that we're or thousand plus units that we are in contract on, forward closing on, or entitlement on, and you know we see a real opportunity here not only on multifamily as that asset class starts to correct and serve its pricing, but also on the built to rent side to put together a portfolio and you know, meet the large capital flows that are excited to be in the space, see the same dec- economics and demographics that we did, and um, we think there's a big opportunity in the next five to ten years to grow that business. How does your team set itself apart from other investment groups? You know, how do you think about deals? How do you position yourself on the market? What really sets you apart? Sure. I, mean, I think I hope it's a variety of things. I think that we're, you know, very disciplined in sort of our underwriting. And I, having spent most of my career on the institutional investment side of the business, we're not. I mean, I looked at a lot of developer underwritings and, you know, they tend to be aggressive and sort of believe unrealistic expectations and unrealistic rent growth and unrealistic sort of rents for an area. And we try to be very... Um, and probably to a fault, because I think most LPs will automatically discount whatever a developer gives you. We try and spend time saying, like, here's how we thought about this. Here's how we came up with this thesis. Like, we think this is an ironclad underwriting. So I think underwriting discipline, I think geographic discipline, so really being focused on best in class locations, um, really thinking about, like, where will infill be? Where is this going to be over the next few years? I think it's critical. And then I think the last piece is having this this expertise. It's having the in-house ability to develop. So having, you know, JNS Homes is sort mm-hmm. of a captive partner that will execute, especially across Florida on some of these build to rent um, home construction. And also in other markets where we might choose a third party developer or contractor, whether it's single family or multifamily, having that construction expertise in-house, I think is critical at making sure, you know, we're not just investment guys and development guys trying to bid out a GMP. Um, what specific markets or subsectors does your team focus on and why? Sure. So we are our, our, our mandate is really East Coast, Southeast and Sunbelt. And, you know, what that probably means in reality is, you know, sort of New York, South to Florida, out to Texas. We're spending a lot of time in the Southeast because we think that market has, you know, and for a long time, you know, we've been interested in this theme of high quality of life, low cost of living, low tax. And even pre-COVID, you saw population shifts and you saw employment growth along those lines. COVID was like jet fuel to that thesis. And so you've seen just a right. huge number of people and importantly, a huge number of jobs and employment shift down to this market. So, you know, with that, we are, um, you know, investing in all these areas that have grown. And we think, you know, that base of new growth and that base of new population makes all of these you know, markets, this Raleigh's, Charlotte's, Nashville's, you know, West Palm Beach, Miami, Tampa, that new base of employment, that new base of people, the next 10 years, even with sort of near-term headwinds, is on a great growth trajectory. So that's sort of the baseline to sort of growth. And then we, you know, I I spent a ton of my career, you know, up and down the East Coast in sort of the New York market, for example, as did Steve, as did Nick. And I think we we think there's opportunities there to maybe look at something contrarian, see a a, a city that, you know, we're never going to rule against, bet against New York. We think there's great long-term growth there. And can we find opportunities that are priced well? if folks are more skittish in some of these urban environments. So um, I think it's both betting behind sort of good growth dynamics, as well as looking at sort of opportunistic contrarian chances to bet on markets that are you know, having a harder time these days. Got it. Given current market changes, how are you setting up Shoreham for success? And can you speak to some current projects that you're working on and what's most exciting about them? Sure. I mean, I think 
one of the most important things to keep in mind in the current environment is cost of capital. We've seen a massive change in cost of capital over the past year. And you know that is driving a huge amount of investment decisions, a huge amount of investability of assets. Um, you know, you talk about this wall of maturities that are coming due. And you know, all of this, this cost of capital is going to drive a lot over the next 12 to 18 months. So, you know, we've always been cautious in terms of, you know, how high we, we, we lever things, you know, what are these sort of dynamics of assets we buy. And so, you know, in, in, in the beginning of the business, there were like unlimited opportunities to buy things, you know, quickly. There's tons of capital that was super available and excited, but we sort of had stuck to this, like, look, we want to be in the, you know, six to seven untrended return on cost range for the projects we're doing. That probably prohibits us from doing multifamily at that time. That's what had us focus mostly on build to rent at that time. And that paid big dividends because, you know, a lot of these maturities, a lot of the sort of big concerns, those folks that went in and bought two and a half cap and three and three and a half cap multifamily projects that said money will be free forever. Growth will happen forever. So I think remaining disciplined and looking to sort of a more normalized long-term average um, yield is something that we've been focused on and has serviced well, served us well. Uh, I think also, um, you know, in the current current environment, there's you know, it's it's much more difficult to raise both debt and equity capital for anything you're doing. So I think that's both good and bad news. I think the you know the bad news is it's it's harder to get deals done, and there's probably some deals that are compelling that you won't be able to get over the finish line given the current headwinds. I think the good news is the deals that you are able to get done are going to be have to be so compelling to meet that bar that if the world stays the same, you know, that's how you underwrite it. Those deals will do well. If the world gets a little bit better in the next three to five years, which again, I don't think we're at the, I can't say whether we're at the bottom of the recession. I certainly can say we're not at the, you know, the top of the economy. I think there's a good chance that things get better and you really have a chance to outperform. So it means looking at, you know, a thousand deals instead of a hundred to find the one you'll do. But if you do that and you get those deals done, I think you're going to be a very good position in, you know, a few years from now. And that's a pretty good transition to our next point, which is looking back at 2023, as we approach the end of the year, you know, what is the current state of the multifamily market? Sure. So, I, I mean, I think, you know, there have been these moments over the last 12 months of, you know, complete halts and then sort of like movement back. So like Q3, Q4 of last year, there was intense uncertainty and you know, it was almost like a complete pause on transaction volume. And then Q1 of this year, it was almost like irrational exuberance where everything was back to normal. People were doing deals. And then, you know, you had SVB and First Republic and these, these regional bank collapses. And that, again, put a halt on the world. I think sitting here in sort of end of August, looking into September post Labor Day, I think you're starting to see the world unfreeze a little bit. I think you're starting to see more transactions start to happen. Um, but I, I'd expect that it's going to be slow going for the next six to 12 months. I think you're still in this period of shakeout. It's sort of hard to point at where we are in the cycle. Are we at the bottom? Are we you know, in the middle? You know, what sort of does the future hold? So I think that will probably slow transactions. You're going to see an improvement over sort of what happened over the last three months, but it'll still be very slow relative to the prior year. And then what trends do you think are are going to last and which ones do you think we're going to shake off sooner rather than later? It's <sighs> interesting. I mean, I think the the trends that we're seeing, and we sort of talked about this before, was you know these shifts to these new markets. And I think that, you know, as much as you know, some people will go back and you know, I don't but rule out New York. New York is still sort of the financial center of the US. People still want to live there after college. It's an incredibly, incredibly exciting place. And I think that some of the people that move to a Raleigh or Charlotte or a West Palm Beach or Miami might say, you know, this was good, but I want to go back to my family or my community or my friend set that was in New York. And that's happening. But I think much more than the folks who are going back are the folks that are staying. And importantly, it's a much um, higher percentage of the places they're going. So, for example, a statistic I like to use is you look at sort of, you know, class A, B office supply in New York City. And, you know, let's hold aside what if it's occupied these days. But that's, you know, call it a $400 million number, depending on what you're counting, plus or minus. If you look at South Florida and you look at West Palm Beach all the way down to Miami, so West Palm, Boca, Fort Lauderdale, downtown Miami, Brickell, Wynwood, Cape Coral, uh, I'm sorry, um, Coral Gables, all of it, that's about 25 million feet. So 5 million feet leaves New York and comes to Florida which, you know, I would say is probably going to happen over the next few years. You're already seeing a million new here and Miami's got significantly new supply. That's very meaningful for the South Florida office market and, and the South Florida residential market because all of those new, new office space drives new homes. Um, at the same time for New York, it's not super detrimental. It's, you know, 395 versus 400. So 
to me, that's, you know, this lasting trend that you've seen more people live in this area. You've seen adaptation of technology like we're using right now. You've seen, I mean, I had teams on my computer for seven years before COVID and I've never used it once. And I think I use it every day now. So you have more of an ability to take meetings remotely, more of an ability to segment your business where, you know, I still believe in collaboration, having people in the same office, but do all the segments of your business need to be in the same office? Does your accounting team need to sit next to your asset management team, need to sit next to your investments team? And I think you're seeing employers, you know, take advantage of that, offer remote work as, you know, an additional incentive beyond just compensation. So I think there's a lot of these trends that have come out of COVID that I think are here to stay. And you'd mentioned there's, you know, been expansion of tech that you're using. You mentioned Teams. Any other kind of tech that you can share? I'm just kind of curious what else has been implemented. Uh, I mean, I'd say we use a lot of technology in sort of the way we're looking at transactions and deals. Um, I, I don't know if like all of them are necessarily coming out of COVID. I think a lot of it's sort of trying to embrace the technology and, and data you have to figure out the right places to invest. So, I mean, uh, we use, you know, typical products like CoStar and and Green Street Research and other things to try and figure out, you know, where we want to be, what market dynamics are, what projected rent growth might be, what comps are happening in the market. And then we've, you know, talked to certain proprietary research groups about, um, you know, whether it's John Burns or S&P and some other stuff, trying to figure out if they can, you know, using, you know, certain data sets and correlation, trying to figure out, you know, again, where population growth is happening, where employment growth is happening, where that's sticky. And those are the places that we want to put residential uh, developments or investments. Sounds like you put a, a lot of weight on being able to obtain and parse through data. Yeah, I mean, I think it's critical and that's sort of what separates. And, and you know, look, real estate's a local business and you really, especially development, you have to have these relationships, you have to be on the ground, but sort of taking a macro look when you look at sort of as across, across as wide a geographic swath as we do, you want to like think about where to focus your time and build those relationships. And I think that data helps you cull down that information. Well, uh, it sounds like we need to get somebody from the Crexy Intelligence team in touch with you to uh, uh, share what we've got under the hood Absolutely. here in terms of data. Yeah, we'll, we'll take all that we can get. So can you share a little bit about what opportunities and challenges you're seeing being a multifamily investor right now? I mean, I, obviously, there's been a big shift post-COVID and you know some of those trends have stuck around. Um, what are some of the toughest challenges that you're seeing? I mean, I think that there's there's two main drivers of the slow the slowdown in um, development right now and investment. Um, one is that cost of capital. So you have this bid ask spread where you know buyers or owners of real estate you know felt their asset was worth X because cap rates were four and a half, four, three and a half, three, two, whatever the case may be. Um, today your risk free rate's four and a half. So you can't buy a multifamily asset for three and a half if your risk-free rate's four and a half. And so that's a massive value reset. So part of that's, you know, people don't want to transact because they're waiting for things to go back. And maybe cost of capital goes back to where it was, maybe it goes back somewhere in between, but, you know, that to be determined when those values come back. And if it's not cap rate, the change will have to be, you know, rent growth. And so I think if people can wait, they are waiting. I think, you know, on the purchasing side, that same cost, cost of capital is going to impact you because if you're borrowing at, you know, an all-in cost typically of six and a half to seven, it's negative leverage for most things. You're not seeing too many six and a half to seven, you know, multifamily assets to purchase. So, you know, trying to find assets that you, and you have to be super convicted that you're going to drive to north of that yield pretty soon. Otherwise, you're going to be in real trouble. So those dynamics have put a real slowdown. On the development side, it's construction costs. Construction costs have remained naggingly high, especially in these growth markets. So, you know, the ability to develop when, you know, your cost of capital, your cost of borrowing on the development side is that high, your construction costs are the same as they were before when debt was free means there's going to be a huge halt on development. And so I think the result of that will be, and that's you know, sort of going back to the point of like stay convicted, get things done that are super compelling in this environment. You've got to see massive rent growth because if you have a huge, you know, continuing there's sort of undersupply of housing before. Um, you know, there's some multifamily pipeline to work through, but that'll develop. And then none of this new stuff will happen during this freeze. You know, post this freeze, you're going to see a massive uptick in rents. And then you know, sort of one thing follows the other. So we're looking back at that data, figuring out the areas that we see this demand and growing demand, seeing a shortage of new development. And if we can get something done in those markets, we know that even if you're facing headwinds in year one and year two, over a three, five, seven year time horizon, you're going to do really well. I mean, it, it 
it sounds like it's it's nothing but headwinds right now. Um, how do you meet investment goals even in the face of all these challenges? I mean, I think the the trick for us is to be patient. I mean, I think we are you know we we've, we've been fortunate and we're you know be able to get transactions done this year and we're just you know spending a lot of time. It just takes a lot of effort and just looking at lots of deals to find those deals that make sense. Um, and there are a ton of headwinds, but when you find that super compelling deal, you, there is capital that's there that's willing to get things done. It's much harder to get it, but it is possible. So I think um, the being patient for those right opportunities, not just trying to deploy money to deploy money is critical, but I think if you're patient and you do find these opportunities in the current environment, I think you're going to be well rewarded. When you, when you buy stuff, when everybody's buying stuff, I mean, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, that's great. Right now, when you can have conviction and find an opportunity and get something done when others are not. That's a, a much bigger outsized outcome on the upside if it goes well. Well, I'm curious, what's your and Shoreham's outlook on the year ahead? Sure. I mean, I, I think broadly we're optimistic. I think we, we're we hoping outside some external event that we can't predict, that just looking at current market dynamics, you should see an improvement. You should see at least more transaction volume. You know, prices may go down before you know things start to improve, but at least you'll see transactions happening, which for us, you know, we want to see opportunity when we find deals that are, you know, make sense to transact. And then, you know, we're hopeful that, you know, we've been sort of stunted, paused for a pretty good duration of time. And then as we work through some of this, you start to see some green shoots and things improving. So I, I, I'm optimistic for uh, 2024, but, you know, time will, time will tell. We got to see things play out. Well, given your specialized background and expertise, I'm sure our listeners would be curious to your answers for a few rapid fire questions and words of advice that uh, you might have for sure. us. Are you ready? Of course. Go for it. All right. If you were given $50 million today and had to invest it immediately, what would your go-to asset type and location be and why? Sure. So I'm going to, you know, very simple for me to say, um, build to rent communities in Southwest Florida. We see the most growth there, like well-located and we think the asset class has tons of room to run. So that's where we're putting it. Favorite tool or software that you use on the job? And this is not a trick question. Um, <laughs> of course, Craig C. But I, I think uh, CoStar is high on our list as well, given the amount of multi and, and single family we do. And then what is the most common misconception about your job or industry? I think that, um, you know, I guess within sort of like the private equity real estate investment space, I think, you know, the idea that like the smartest guy in the room is always going to win is is a big misconception. This business is a relationship business and you know, finding the right deal to do is, you know, I would say 25 to 35 percent of the battle. The rest of it is working with different relationships, whether it's sellers, lenders, brokers to, to work that deal through and, and get it done. And so that, you know, personal relationships and um, personal relationships and your reputation are critical in being successful in the space. Well, as we wrap up, any parting words you'd like to share with our audience? Um, I would say, uh, you know, continue to weather the, the current storm. It sort of looks bleak today, but I think, you know, work to find those great investments because I think you're well rewarded in a uh, sort of longer time period. Well, thank you again for joining us and sharing your insights. I know you're very busy and we appreciate you sitting down and spending the time with us. Thank you so much for having me. It was, it was a pleasure. Where can people find you online if they want to get in touch? Sure. Email, social media. Yeah, we're, um, you know, we have shoremcapital.com is our website. And then, you know, Doug at shoremcapital.com is you know, easy email. Thank you, Doug. And thanks everyone who tuned in today. If you enjoyed this episode, do not miss the next one. Visit go.crexy.com forward slash podcast and sign up to get the next episode sent directly to your inbox. Of course, you can also subscribe to the Crexy podcast on your favorite podcast app and check out our YouTube channel for video recordings of each episode. Take care and be sure to tune in next time. Mm -hmm.